an exciting place, huh? The energy, I mean, if we could channel it somehow or another, we probably would save the electrical company a few million dollars. What an amazing place. I wanted to thank the artists for making me look like Burt Reynolds. <laughs> really, I'm taking this home to my wife. <laughs> okay, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about hope and innovation among the four billion, the other four billion, the next four billion, because we have an awful lot to learn from them. First, let me tell you about the next four billion. Some of you know what I'm talking about. The next four billion, a huge number of people that actually live on less than $2 a day, okay? Uh, they call the bottom of the pyramid. They're called the uh, base of the pyramid, subsistence consumers, whatever is politically correct, okay? They're reality. And uh, why I am actually thinking and studying of these people. I'm a business professor, and businesses have all of a sudden realized that these folks are important. They don't make a lot of money individually, but they are going to make a whole bunch of money over the next several years because globalization is increasing their discretionary income substantially. This is the next major source of growth. And business people are saying, gee, we really should know something about them because the amazing thing is we don't know that much. We think we know. And then we start getting in there and we realize we know nothing. So a group of eggheads like me decided that we're going to do this and we're going to do this right. And so we started living among them, going out and shopping with them, staying in their homes, seeing where they work. This was the genesis of this research. And of course, we've extended it beyond that, okay? But the idea is that we decided that we're gonna learn something about these folks, okay? Along the way, because I'm an innovation researcher, I became fascinated by how innovative they are, but the interesting ways in which they innovate. One of the things I've always liked to do is study innovation and how getting our body into it somehow changes with the ideas that we can develop, right? You can, you can all figure that out, get your hands dirty, all of a sudden the idea pops. And among the poor, that's, that's, that, that happens a lot. It dawned on me that studying the innovation among the poor was probably one of the purest places where you can study innovation, human innovation, right? If you go into Ideal or if you go into Hewlett Packard or some of these companies, you study innovation, these guys are surrounded by technology, guys and women, great innovators, okay? The idea is they are surrounded by technology. The poor have nothing. So when they innovate, it is really the human innovation that is coming out. And so I decided that this is what I was going to, you know, delve into, right? And so I spent the last couple of years studying innovation among the poor. Where do we start? Well, the first place we have to start out is where they get their stuff. Now, most of you, or so hopefully some of you at least, know that the poor do a lot of scavenging, right? Scavenging is very important because this is where you get your stuff. And Wasteland and some of these other documentaries have talked about it. some of them make a living, getting stuff from the dump, recycling it, that's cool. That's only part of what they scavenge. In fact, it's less than half. What do they do with the other stuff? Well, most of them scavenge so they can go home and make something that they can sell or make something they can use at home. It's either solutions for the market or solutions for the home. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about a couple of them just to kind of put things in perspective, okay? They innovate across a whole bunch of different product categories, okay? Uh, there's a bell, there's an alcohol stove you see up there, there's uh, watering troughs. They innovate across a lot of things. What dictates where they innovate? Whatever the need happens to be, okay? Now here's my friend Lisa, okay? Now Lisa makes soaps for resale in the marketplace, okay? She recycles animal fat, and then she goes around and she buys some herbs, but then she picks a lot of them by the side of the road, buys a few emulsifiers and things like this that she has to, uh, that she needs in order to make the soap. But she makes soap with her mother, and they sell them, right? What's innovative about that? Well, for one thing, she only reads at a fourth grade level, and she's had to teach herself how to use a computer. But probably her most innovative uh, is a notion is how she's incorporated modern market practices into her, into the way she runs her business. She'll tell you, I run a very responsible business. I test every product that we sell, just like Procter & Gamble does, okay? So really, Lisa, how do you do that? Well, we test it ourselves. 
She has her own little mechanism for testing products. She does it on herself, her mother, and her sisters. They are her guinea pigs, okay? And they do this, and they document it in a broken way. They do it. They document everything, and they never put a product out there, or at least they never put a product out there that they didn't make one of them break out, okay? <laughs> Once in a while, we still have a disaster. But she pays very close attention, okay? And then there's Rick. Uh, I can't show you a picture of Rick, I'm sorry, because this is being streamed all over the world and it's going to be ensconced on the internet forever. Uh, I didn't want to put Rick's picture out there. Rick is a man on the run. Uh, He lost his wife and his daughter to narco traffic in in Colombia. He ran away. He lost his land. He's living. He's surviving. But he doesn't necessarily want to know where the people that are still after him are going to find him. So he's, uh, you know... He's off the grid, so to speak, but he is very creative. And so he has scavenged bicycle parts, he scavenged uh, methodologies, and he's come up with a very innovative support for his hammocks. He's also very innovative in his business model. That support that you see right there will not break. So he scavenges the material that he weaves a hammock from, and he'll offer you a deal. He says, hey, if you buy a hammock from me, you pay me a premium, but oh, by the way, if it ever breaks, I will repair it for half price if you bring me back the supports. Why? Because he knows that the supports are not going to fail. And they never do. They never fail. Again, very innovative type of guy across a whole bunch of different categories. Okay, so the poor are innovative. Big deal, right? Bring it home, Rosa. Okay, let's bring it home. What did we learn? Okay, we've interviewed hundreds of these folks. We've been out there in the field. What have we learned that we can bring home here? And one of the interesting things has to do with what Steve was talking about that his mother gave him. He didn't call it this, but I'm going to call it this, and that's hope. Now, I'm a psychologist by training, so I can tell you that I look at hope in a somewhat detached manner, okay? But hope is an emotion, but it is a very powerful emotion, okay? And hope is critically important to the innovation of the poor. And in that laboratory of pure human innovation, I've learned that hope is important here and now, okay? Why? Well, one of the things that research has shown is that hope gives us energy. Now, the poor are just as focused on having hope and retaining hope as they are on getting stuff. Why? Because they understand the role of hope. See, you need just enough. If you have too much hope, you go a little hog wild. You're going to see that in a minute. But if you don't have any hope, that becomes the focus. When people lose hope because of something bad happening in their lives, I can promise you, they are going to go out there and they're going to do things to restore their hope because they understand hope is critical. Hope provides us energy to scavenge, to experiment, to try new things, to see possibilities in the junk by the side of the road. We need hope, and they understand that. And so they pursue it, and they manage it very effectively, okay? We all need hope. We should be about the business of building hope in one another because it gives us that energy, okay? Now, another thing that hope does, which is very cool, is that it allows us to engage in what we call healthy delusion, okay? The psychologists like to call that motivated reasoning, whatever that, you know, yeah. you, you know hey, you know, we have to invent words. Healthy delusion, what does that mean? That means that's the ability to look at the argument or the countervailing evidence that thinks it says you can't do it and to ignore it in favor of the belief that yes, you can, right? Healthy delusion comes from hope, okay? Healthy delusion in turn comes, it leads to creative deviance, okay? It leads to being able, trying things, trying things outside the norm, bending the rules. Now, this is where too much hope can get you in trouble, right? If your hope is so high that your healthy delusion really starts getting delusional, you are probably going to bend the rules too much. You're going to engage in criminality. And there's plenty of evidence that suggests that some of the most creative people also are engaged in criminality, right? Terrorists and narco traffickers. And that's Pablo Escobar, by the way. You all recognize Che Guevara, but the other guy is Pablo Escobar. You know, and the people who work for Pablo and the people who work with Che were all very creative people. Healthy delusion leading to aggressive creative deviance. So the poor also recognize that too much hope can get you in trouble 
and they're always trying to maintain that balance, okay? We need to engage in healthy delusion a little bit and help our neighbors to engage in healthy delusion, not to the criminal level, please. Although then again, once in a while, a little criminality may not be bad in our day and age, but don't, don't, don't. I, actually, I just said that on the internet, right? Oh, the FBI, the CIA and the FBI will now put me on their list. I'm already on TSA's watch list, what the heck, you know? <laughs> okay, the third thing that we learn about hope is the importance of conversation, okay? Now, I'm going to go to this. Hope and innovation are fueled by conversation, and lonely people are not innovative. In order to to illustrate that, I'm going to tell you a story about a mine, okay? All right, mine in Chile, biggest mine in the world. We have a problem. We have a problem with loading those big barrels that you see there, okay? And the engineer comes up with a solution. It fails miserably. He blames the workers. What a surprise. Okay? The workers are illiterate folks that work there. They don't really have a heck of a lot, but they have one thing. They have community. These guys talk to each other. They're together all the time. So what do they do? Overnight, they work. They come together and come up with a very creative solution to the problem, which they implement overnight. So the engineer who had blamed them comes in in the morning and finds a system that works. Now, it wasn't because these guys were geniuses. They did it because they were talking. They had hope, and that led to their innovativeness, okay? So hope, three things, right? We need the energy, we need the healthy delusion, and we fuel it through conversation. Last thing, okay, my takeaway, we can learn much more from the next four billion. We can learn not only about their hope, we can innovativeness, we can learn about how the solutions that they come up with. And we can bring it home. So as you're thinking about poor people around the world, don't see them as a liability. See them as an asset. Thank you.